Welcome, my name is Natasha Sherman and I am your host. My guest today is Floor Edwards. She is the author of Apocalypse Child, A Life in End Times, a memoir. For the first 13 years of her life, Floor grew up in the Children of God, also known as the family. The group's nomadic existence was based on the belief that as God's chosen people, they would be saved in the impending apocalypse that would envelop the rest of the world in 1993. Floor would be 12 years old at that time. Welcome, Floor. Thank you so much for having me. So I just want to say that I loved your book. Thank you. So it, and, and it, there wasn't anything apocalyptic that happened in it, but you just drew me into your world. And, um, and that's a tough thing to do because I just kept looking forward to, to getting back into your world. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. I invite anybody who likes a good read and can kind of live in somebody else's shoes for a while. So uh, your mom and dad joined uh, Children of God when they were in their 20s or? And, yeah, in their early 20s. And they met in the Children of God. And That's correct. so from what I understand, you know, it, it was kind of the appeal was living a more meaningful life, living a spiritual life. And yet what's interesting to me is that David or Father David, uh, the leader of this cult, uh, they never met him and you never did either. That's correct. And your whole lives were devoted to his teachings. Mm -hmm. So the thing I first want to touch on, you were born in America, but at age what? You... I was born in Sweden. Oh, you actually. were born in Sweden. Yeah. And then, because your mother was Swedish. Is My Sweden... mom is Swedish. And then we moved to Mexico when I was six months, uh, California when I was one, and then we moved to Thailand when I was four. So basically... So by the time I had been on three continents already. Right. Wow. So basically, you know, at four up until then, you're not remembering much. So most of your early childhood memories are probably living in Thailand. Yeah, most of my memories are from Thailand. Yes. So I guess one of the biggest things for me is, you know, there's a whole inquiry about why we choose to follow somebody. And, and that's the unanswerable question, because I think everybody does it for different reasons. Uh, my big unanswerable question is why do you need someone to tell you how to live your life and then mm -hmm. giving over your decision-making process? I guess the mm -hmm. biggest thing for me though is why would you choose to follow someone who's telling you that it's all mm -hmm. gonna be over at the age of mm -hmm. you were going to be 12 and yet he told mm -hmm. everybody, have more kids, procreate, bring mm -hmm. them into this world to die? Yeah, essentially, yes. Um, I always like to tell people that nobody joins a cult. Um, I actually came across that through research. And it really hit me as something that I believed and I began to understand as I did research and as I wrote this book, is that they didn't know what they were joining when they joined it. And I think that was the really difficult part about coming out of it. And a lot of the children who did grow up, it's, it's almost like we have a hard time knowing who to blame because... A lot of wrong was done to us, but in some ways the parents were also victims, you know. Um, I did do a lot of research when I was writing this book, and I began to understand what draws people into cult. And it, it's partly a sense of belonging, a sense of community, that's, that's a really big part of it. Um, but it's usually a belief system. It's some sort of idea that people want to, to sort of buy into. Um, and they didn't join in the beginning when the, when when everyone was joining the group was forming. Um, Father David wasn't telling them it was going to end. That came later. Um, and then the idea to create and make all these children for the end of the world that again was something they just they just bought into once they were already in and once it was sort of like a group thing. So everyone came together and started believing this thing together. And I think in that sense it was a very complicated um, existence. You know, I absolutely agree that uh, people pr do not go in thinking they're joining a cult or wanting to join a cult. And I mm -hmm. think there is something that evolves and happens and it occurs like, 
like they don't know in a sense what they're fully getting into. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's almost like Stockholm syndrome. And mm -hmm. uh, so you start buying in a little at a time and then all of a sudden you're, you've bought into all of it. You're fully immersed, yeah. yeah. Um, there was an article that came out in 2005 when Ricky Rodriguez um, died. And one of the members said, um, if you put a frog in hot water, it's going to jump right out. But if you put it in warm water, you'll have frog legs for dinner. And I thought that really exemplified, you know, what joining a cult is like. They, they come, there's bait. There's always something that draws them in. And I always, when I talk about my story, um, people always want to know about Father David and what I think about him. And it's true, I never met him. I never even knew what he looked like. Um, but he did have this draw. And I think when I started to write the book, I began to understand the complexities of his character. Uh, there was sort of like a method to his madness. It, it wasn't all bad, right? Like some of the stuff he taught was actually really interesting. You know, it was very much about going against the status quo and you know, creating a new paradigm. And it didn't start out dark. It started out very innocent, you know, um, but he was he was a very disturbed man with a lot of demons. And I think there were certain things about himself that he just didn't want to face. And so one thing that a narcissistic cult leader does is that they they sort of turn the mirror on others and they make other people look at their own faults and their own shortcomings instead of them having to look at themselves. And then in turn, us children had to do that. So at a very young age, I remember four or five years old, I was constantly being told that I wasn't good enough. You know, I was constantly having to search my soul for demons. And, and this, plus I was supposed to save the world. So this was a very big burden to bear on my shoulders. Yes, and <laughs> you describe it so well. Uh, you know, the fact is, we all have our own belief systems. Exactly, and yeah. what are you gonna teach your children? Your belief systems. And right. so, again, it's not with malicious intent, but uh, there's this quote that somebody published on uh, one of my Facebook pages a long time ago, and it said, five minutes after your birth, they decide your name, nationality, religion, and sect, and you spend the rest of your life defending something you didn't even choose. Hmm. Or you spend the rest of your life undoing what, you know. So clearly, and, and uh, clearly there were good things about it, but here you are at a very young age, you think it's your job to save the world, you mm -hmm. think the world is coming to an end, you're going to die uh, at five years old, you realize, okay, I got seven years left. Mm -hmm. And at one point you say, um, you used to pray for a shot to the heart. So mm -hmm. it would be quick and easy, so you wouldn't uh, suffer. And there's this line you write, I realize now that terror was home to me. Pretty soon mm -hmm. I wouldn't know how to function without the drama of trepidation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how did that shape who you are today? That's a really good question. Um, I think in some ways I've overcome a lot of my fears. Uh, I think in some ways it gave me a lot of courage. I think we all have fears that we have to face in life and a big part of life is overcoming those fears. But for me, just being born into the children of God, just being alive was a fear because I was told I wasn't going to live. So once I left the cult, it, every single day I was facing my fear by being alive. That makes sense. Wow, yes. Wow. Yep, <laughs> yes, in a strange <laughs> way. Uh, so yeah. the other thing is, so, you know, the end didn't come. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and again, you know, like any cult, and it occurs to me like, uh, Father David devolved and, and mm -hmm. kept morphing. So at first education wasn't good, but then all of a sudden you should be educated because if legally uh, people came and asked you if you were in school, you could say, yes, we're being homeschooled and we're missionaries. Then there was the whole sexuality issue and some cults, you know, and again, it depends whose experience it is because I saw someone being interviewed from the children of God, different families, whatever, and she uh, was devastated that she was encouraged to have sex mm -hmm. as a very young, young girl and that feeling like she couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. And then 
But then again, you look back at the 60s, you know, it was the sexual revolution. So, yes, have sex, you know, with anybody you want. And, and then mm -hmm. Father David didn't encourage uh, monogamy. He encouraged sharing. And then, um, so it's all kind of woven in there. And, but then he has women going out and suggests that they use their bodies to kind of bring them men into the fold. And there's even this expression, uh, hookers for Jesus. Or mm -hmm. um, uh, what was that um, fishing? Uh, flirty, flirty fishing. Flirty fishing, flirty yeah. Fishing. And you know, again, you go, uh, it's so easy to see how you go up to here and then all of a sudden it's, Cross the, the line. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I always tell people, I, I, sometimes I think it's important to let people know that I did not experience um, sexual abuse. I experienced other types of abuse, for sure, psychological, um, even some physical. Um, but there were a lot of children. As, as I, after I published my book, I, I became more aware of how much sexual abuse did go on. And for a long time, I wasn't sure these stories were true. I would hear about them. But again, I was having my process of healing. So it's hard when you're healing to also take in other people's stories. Yes. After I wrote my book and published it, um, it started to see that, yes, it did go on. So, you know, I'm, I, I feel very bad for, for the children who did suffer in that way. Um, but I never did have to do any of that. Um, what I got clear about was how much you loved your parents. And that, you know, so you lived in these huge <laughs> combinations of families. And the thing is that any parent was allowed to discipline you in whatever way they chose. And sometimes it was brutal. And for me, again, that's hard to understand. But as you said, your parents were out on the road getting trained and you were left with other adults who did whatever they did. Um, and not even having a huge experience of being a nuclear family, it occurs to me that you longed for that, just to have mm -hmm. your family. Mm -hmm. And I also got that in the end, as you say, you know, it would be easy to look for somebody to blame, and one mm -hmm. wants to do that, uh, but your parents, again, were in their own world of believing and they had kind of separated from the rest of their family. And you're living inside of a community where you're all being taught the same thing and it starts to seep in. Do your parents talk about this particular journey openly or is it something that is hard for them? Um, in the beginning, it was very difficult something we didn't really talk about. We, I was the one, along with my sisters, to, to bring it to my parents' attention that this was a cult. Um, I think after some time, they started to understand and realize. I think, I think the whole group, especially after the Ricky Rodriguez murder-suicide, they understood something had gone horribly wrong. Um, there's never been quite the sincerest acknowledgement, I think, that the kids want. But when it comes to healing, this is just my own personal belief, I, again, I saw something on Facebook where it said, you're not responsible for your abuse, but you are responsible for your healing. Mm. And I, when, you, when, when wrong has been done to you, you have to heal somehow. You know? And I, I remember being very young. I was a young teenager, and I, just, I had this very strong realization that if I wanted to blame my circumstances on anyone, I would have so many reasons that I would go into such a deep, dark hole that I would never come out of it. So for me, it was just, it was a personal decision to make to, instead of trying to blame someone or find reasons why it wasn't fair, to just take it and, and make something of it. Um, and that's sort of how the book was born. Yeah, um, and at one, so here you are in Asia, and then uh, you don't die in 1993, and then Father David dies, and then, Everybody is left rudderless. And uh, so this person that you've never met, but who controlled your life, who was your decision maker, who was uh, the air that you breathed, and all of a sudden, you know, you're left to your own devices. And your parents have been operating not in the Western world. They've just kind of been 
they're not holding down regular jobs. They're out there preaching and uh, subsisting inside of large groups of people. And now suddenly, you know, what do you do? So your parents chose to come back to America. And I think mm -hmm. that's where I want to go next with your story. So you come back and I love you said I'd never seen so many white people in my life. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, here you are back in your, quote, home country, and you're a stranger in a strange land. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like, you know, and you don't know the rules of the game. No. So you've never been in a public school. You've never, go ahead, you were going to say something. I, I, I just did an interview recently, um, and people find this interesting. I'd never seen advertisements. So I remember one of the, one of the most striking things, and I don't think I mentioned this too much in the book, was was just looking around me and seeing words in a language that I could understand. You know, we had never seen TV. We had never read any books other than the Bible and Father David's teaching. So, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was difficult on so many levels because, and I hope I had brought this out in the book, was this idea of feeling like a stranger. You know, um, I, I might not look at, like, if, if I were to go to school, you'd think, oh, she's, she's, she fits a certain demographic, if you know what I mean. Yes. But inside, I was just, had no idea. I felt like, I, I say this, and I felt like an alien. Like, I literally belonged nowhere. Um, and yet, in, you know, I, was, I am American, and in my own country, I was completely lost. I mean, probably more lost than, you know, the stories that you read about of, you know, immigrants or, you know, it was, it was a completely different world that I wasn't only sheltered from, but that I was warned against. So, wow, yes, scary. It wasn't just like I had not been here. It was like I was constantly warned. This is this is evil. This is America. But I was also quite intrigued by it. You know, I'm not going to lie. I was sure. Um, I remember looking around and just wondering, like, what what is this world? What you know, what's going on? Why why were you warned against it? Yeah. And so you went to school, and typically we all have some alienating experiences at school at different ages. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you already feel like an alien and then people treat you like an alien and there are some cruel episodes, you know, of you, you wrote this note to befriend this girl. She never spoke to you again. And you're a twin. And, uh, you know, some girl calls you the gutter twins. And uh, so it's like uh, <laughs> the sense of being from another planet. And, mm -hmm. and at some point you say that um, you picked up, so uh, you picked up this magazine, Seventeen magazine, and there was a questionnaire. And this was like, from what I gather, a pivotal moment in your life. And the questionnaire Very. was, did you grow up in a cult? Mm -hmm. So you answer this questionnaire and? Take this quiz and find out. Yeah, I, I took this quiz. As I read um, the questions when I'm doing events and readings, um, I realize how actually profound those questions are. They really do sort of um, dig into what being a cult is, which is the isolation. You know, it wasn't just about lifestyle or, you know, certain aspects of characteristics of a cult. It was really about how controlled are you? Um, I could read the questions if you want or... Um, uh, sure, just read a couple. So the other thing is, while you're looking, is that uh, you discover that, uh, so you, uh, you know, you're living, uh, feeling like an alien, then you discover that you've been raised in a cult, and then the kind of confronting your parents, and actually kind of coming to grips with, it seems to me you went to your twin sister, is it Tamar? Tamar, yes. Yeah. yeah. Saying, we grew up in a cult. Mm -hmm. So tell me some of the questions. Um, so the questions, did you grow up in a secluded environment? Were you under the influence of a charismatic leader? Were you coerced to recruit members to your group? Were you prohibited from leaving the premises unless you were recruiting members? And were you taught that the world outside was a forbidden place? And did you feel guilty for wanting to leave? Wow. Wow. Those were the five questions, and I answered a resounding yes to every single one. And that moment, that day, um, I always say it was kind of like everything became clear and unclear at the same time, because now at least I knew what had happened, 
But at the same time, I felt more loss because the realization um, was so profound and just made me even more, I was already very confused and I just didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do with that information or that knowledge, but at least now I knew, you know, right. sometimes it's harder than not knowing, you know, they say ignorance is bliss. Um, so yeah, once I knew it was, it was sort of like, where do I go from here? And I just remember those words. I grew up in, my God, I grew up in a cult. That's all I could think of days was I grew up in a cult. I grew up in a cult. Oh my God, I grew up in a cult. Wow. Um, that's what I think about. So, um, at that point, you did some of the things that one would expect that you do. You become mm -hmm. rebellious, and at some point, you actually tried to commit suicide, right? I do, yes. And, yes. and was this soon after this discovery? Mm -hmm. This was probably a year after. Um, yeah, it was, I, I talk about this in the book. Um, you know, it was, it was a young sort of, really rash attempt at suicide. But I really did think that I was, you know, going to take my life then. And I think there was this proximity to death that was close. So I didn't care so much. I was actually watching one of your other shows as I was doing research for this. And she was talking, one of the, your guests was talking about a young girl who didn't care if she died or not. And I was like, oh my God, that was me. Um, but yeah, I was just programmed to to think that, to, to kind of live very frivolously. And I mean, sometimes I wonder if it affects me now as an adult, like I, I just don't think as much um, of the future as most people do maybe. But but yeah, I think it was, it was partly just a lot of anger and a lot of teenage angst and anxiety and feeling rejected and quite frankly, not knowing how I was gonna deal with the world. And then also just feeling very kind of close to death. Like I had thought about it all my life, it wasn't a big deal, you know, I was prepared for it. Um, so thankfully it didn't work, but a lot of kids did grow up like me. A lot of kids actually that I knew did um, end up taking life tragically. Uh, David's son, right? You mentioned yeah. murder-suicide or was that his son? Yeah, it was his adopted son. So it wasn't his biological son, right. but he did live with him. Um, us kids were taught to sort of honor him he was our role model. He was supposed to be the heir to Father David's throne um, if, if he ever died. You know, it's funny because I thought so much about my own death, and I, I mentioned this when the leader dies, that I had never even thought of him dying. As a young child, as five years old, I was thinking of myself dying at 12. Right. But he had created such an immortal um, figure in our minds that we never thought, like, oh, what's going to happen when Father David dies? Although he was grooming his his, bio, his um, adopted son was Ricky Rodriguez to sort of take over when he died. Um, and in 2005, I came home one day and find out through the news that he had committed a murder suicide. And this was, um, it sent shockwaves. Who did he I, kill? It was more shocking than who did me. he? Who did he murder? He murdered um, his babysitter from a childhood who, who had, you know, sexually molested him right. when he was a child. So uh, it's so complex, and I'm going to jump fast forward because there are a couple of things I want to talk about. So mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, you, you kind of, you, you go to school, you, uh, you suddenly start to discover aspects of who you are and uh, start to feel your own self-worth. Um, uh, the thing, I guess, I, because nothing's really black and white. And mm -hmm. um, I love what you said at some point about uh, maybe Jesus didn't want a religion. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's the interpreters that you mistrust. And I thought, wow, that's pretty brilliant. Um, but in the end, there were good things and there were not so good things. And, and um, what is it that probably was the most difficult to overcome? Gosh, that's such a good question. You know, that changes with time. When I was younger, it was one thing. As I get older, it's another thing. Most recently, I think it's this idea that I just, I wasn't taught to think of the future. I, you know, recently I was telling someone, actually in an interview, he was he was trying to get the, what it's like. What is it like for you now? And I said, just imagine that they took the part of your brain that's meant to make plans for the future and they just scraped it out of your skull. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of harsh and dramatic, no. but... Uh, no. Yeah, I think just we weren't taught to think about the future or value ourselves as as 
people, you know, we were sort of just numbers and um, not really seen. We weren't seen as 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 people. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, again, we all have to overcome something, but this mm -hmm. is much more compelling because it was the water you swimmed in, the air you breathed. Uh, but I like that you start out the book by saying, looking back, I can say with certainty that beyond the madness, yet amid the chaos, it was a magical childhood. The only thing mm -hmm. certain about childhood is that it begins with magic. And I think that's very powerful to be able to say that, uh, having come through a lot of things that didn't feel so magical. Uh, we're almost out of time, and I would like you to read an excerpt that we talked about from the book because I thought it was pretty profound and significant. So would you I would love that? to. Okay. Sure. This comes towards the end um, when I'm sort of processing everything that happened. I thought about how people who joined the children of God were looking for a way out of their ordinary lives. Although I didn't agree with what they did, I understood an inner urge had pushed them to drop everything, including family and friends, to join a group that promised them something more than their worldly existence could provide. They were people of action and passion. I don't know that I would have made the same choice as they did, but I could empathize with them now, especially after having had my own negative experiences with the outside world. I was starting to see what they had wanted to escape from. They were trying to escape a life of monotony, the illusion of the American dream. Yeah, that's very powerful. Um, so we're kind of, we're at the end of our time, and uh, you know, there's so much more I could ask, and the whole inquiry of, you know, uh, what has people look for other people to make decisions for them, and, and it's not necessarily an intentional psychology. thing. Yeah, the whole psychology, psychology of it. But I think a it's such a, a worthy inquiry for each of us, because each of us buys into something that was given to us rather than originated from us. Mm -hmm. And I agree. So I invite people to read your book. It's compelling, interesting, and it raises a lot of questions as well as it's a great story. So, for, you so thank you so much for doing the interview. Uh, good luck with the book. And I'm looking forward to your next one. And hopefully there will be a next one. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us.